It comes every night without fail. There are different people every time. Let's get this done quickly. Get whatever the warden want and get home. But I recognize them somehow. What the hell is this place? They're screaming at me. I don't hear them, but I know they're screaming. You got anything? Such hate and anger. I hope you bastards are looking up once in a while. Those fuckers might be anywhere. I don't know what I have done to them. This place is so damn dark. Sleepers. They want me to feel what they feel. This is good, man. This is good stuff. It'll trade. Everything trades. Oh, fuck. To be honest, any second, take your eyes on that door. Ah, shit, there's fucking loads of them. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the fourth uh, Game Developer Interview podcast with Simon Wicklund from Ten Chambers Collective. So, hello, Simon. Hello. Uh, how are you doing, man? I'm good. Thank you. So, you're living in Sweden, don't you? Uh, I am, yeah. Yeah, that's not far away. Are you uh, in Stockholm or, or somewhere else in Sweden? No, we're in Stockholm. Uh, okay, all cool. of Ten Chambers is uh, is in Stockholm, actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure did I mention, but uh, I'm 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 from Finland, so we're almost neighbors. But yeah. uh, but hey, Simon. So can you uh, open up a little about that? Uh, who are you and what do you do? Well, uh, I've been working professionally in the uh, game development uh, industry for 18 years, uh, and uh, I've mostly focused on sound. And anything you hear, uh, it's been sound effects, it's been music, it's been voiceover, directing voice actors, co- composing music, implementing music in games. Uh, I've also dabbled with some um, creative direction and, and game design and, and, st- and things like that. And uh, I've been part of small teams that have grown into huge companies. Um, I was a part of Grin in the early days back in 2000, and then that grew into a huge company with over like 300 people. And then it went bankrupt and we started uh, Overkill and we went back to being like nine people again. And um, Overkill was purchased by Starbreeze. Uh, mm-hmm. And that then that company grew into like 350 people. And uh, then I quit Starbreeze back in 2015. And now I am with um, with uh, 10 Chambers and we're nine people and we have no ambition to grow <laughs> again because uh, we like it. We like the size. Uh, we yeah. like to be to be able to have, you know, many hats or be required yeah. to have many hats. So, um, uh, of course, uh, I'm, I'm, um, mainly responsible for, for audio and uh, music and voice in, uh, in our upcoming game GTFO. But, uh, since we're such a small company, I also, uh, do some, um, some documentation and, um, um, community management and things like that. Yeah. And, Talking about GTFO, uh, the game looks amazing. Like uh, uh, the uh, sounds and uh, the sounds and graphics and everything look so amazing in the game, and uh, it ha- has already got some uh, E3 nominations and so forth. So it's looking really nice. Uh, so everyone who's listening should go now to Steam and look for GTFO because that looks that just looks really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. So, go there. Go go to the Steam page and and if you like it, add it to the to your to your wish list. Yeah, you should. But uh, so you're uh, responsible of the sounds of GDFO, are you? Yeah, we we have one other member uh, in our nine man crew who who is actually also uh, mainly a professional sound designer. So two out of nine people are professional sound designers, which is a pretty high percentage uh, of, of a team. You yeah, know, yeah. That many uh, sound designers. So yeah, uh, he uh, has done all the weapon sounds and uh, the foley sounds, and he did some monster sounds and, and things like that. But then he has also expanded, and uh, uh, on his skill set, and started working on level design and, and things like that. So over time, it's been uh, I've been I've always been uh, rep- responsible for the voiceover recordings and casting the voice actors and 
and uh, directing the voice actors and, and editing the voice recordings <clears throat> and also all the music production and uh, implementing the music in the game. But um, uh, sound design has been his responsibility and then gradually I've taken over and uh, recently I've, I've done pretty much all of the sound effects. Yeah. So yeah, uh, I am responsible for the sound effects, but there is another guy who, who who's helping out as well and does a really yeah. I'm really pretty sure that I'm in game like uh, GDFO, the sounds are in a big big part of the game. So basically, if you screw those up, you screw half of the game. So so it's a big big shoes to uh, fill uh, in this type of a game. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it's it's a horror game of sorts. Uh, so it's very important to know where the enemies are. So you know, creating sort of a uh, an audio experience in the game where you can actually like get the at atmosphere so you hear some creepy sounds and stuff like that but you can also pinpoint the monster sounds and and you can tell you know uh, you have the ability to detect from which direction the threats are yeah yeah coming and absolutely like that. yeah it's very important so uh, we, 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 yeah. we, I just want to say we want to create um, a game that is very challenging, and then of course you want the player to to uh, admit when when the player dies that oh it was my fault it, it was it was a fair challenge. So we don't want to you know we want to give the player a lot of information like where the monsters are and, and things like that and how many there are and, and and so on. So we're trying to to give the player a lot of information and the the sound is of course a, a very important tool in that yeah sense. that's that's for sure but um so uh a little bit uh like like personal personal questions but uh, uh so for you uh why do you make games in the first place what is the reason you even started <laughs> and why you still continue doing that <laughs> uh well basically uh I like playing games, of course. Uh, so I'm a consumer of games. Uh, and I was already back in the mid 80s when I was like five, six years old. I got a Nintendo 8 bit console and I played a lot of uh, video games growing up and, 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 and PC games as well. And um, yeah, then I just happened to go to high school in, in the same class as Ulf Andersson, who is the founder, who was one of the founders of Grin. And then um, after Grin, uh, we founded uh overkill together so all these companies that i mentioned uh that i mentioned in my introduction um i've worked with with ulf so it's been pretty much due to my connection with him really uh and uh it's all i've done pretty much since high school so i don't know anything else really yeah so yeah that, <laughs> i guess that's why i'm here so you're making games because uh, uh that's the only thing you know <laughs> yeah exactly i'm, st I'm yeah. stuck i'm stuck with this yeah <laughs> Yeah. Okay, but uh, you say that you've been in the industry for uh, was it eighteen years so far? Yes. So, uh, what do you think of the state of the uh, game industry? Because it changed a lot during that eighteen years. So, what do you think of the current situation of game industry? Well, there are so many aspects to it, so uh, it's a very broad question. But uh, from 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 my point of view, it's a little bit like the. Uh, like the music industry, it's been it's much easier now to release something. It's easier to release music, to record your own music and put it out. Just as it's easier to create your own, you know, it's not necessarily easy, easier to create the games, but um, it's easier to get in contact with your customers. You don't have to have, you know, through internet you can you can release your pr product worldwide, uh, even without distribution, like physical distribution which you needed before internet was uh you know the, the bandwidth was, was uh high enough so that people could actually download games then but back in the day you would actually have to you know press dvds or cds and send them out to stores across the world and then you would have to have a distribution deal and you know with a publisher and everything and it cost a lot of money yeah um, i was about to say that and that stuff costed money so it, it isn't for uh, it wasn't for everyone there Ex exactly so so um now the bar has been lowered like you can create a game you know and then put it out and then it's it's available to everyone in the world through internet which is fantastic but then of course on the other hand that makes the the market sort of flooded with with products so uh so there's there's more to choose from for the for the users 
but it's not necessarily easier to find the really the really great games you know yeah uh, so it's it's a mixed bag sort of uh i'm certainly happy that um there are uh, more more to choose from as a consumer you know i like a lot of retro you know the smaller games and i li- like side scrollers and, and retro looking games uh and I know, i've been playing a lot of that stuff uh even since the the revolution of you know 3d graphics uh so uh i'm all for it but as i said like the the market is very yeah it's flooded uh and i'm i'm happy that Storefronts such as uh, Steam have these, uh, you know, these ways to to look at what you have consumed or liked before, what games you own, and um, and then suggest new games to you and help you out in finding in this sea of available games. You know, help yeah. you find which ones you might like. And then, of course, you have to be very active on like social media. Maybe follow some Twitter account where they review. Yeah. Or you know, suggest new games uh, yeah. within the genre that you're interested in. So it it takes a little bit more effort from the from the consumer, I'd say, to find the the things. Yeah. But there are great things out there, and uh, that and that's a that's good. Yeah, and uh, of course, it's the same for the game developers. I think is uh, that uh, um, only making a good game isn't enough today. You actually have to. Uh, focus in you uh, the marketing part how you're gonna do that and how you make the get the exposure your game needs and stuff like that so making the best game in the world isn't just enough nowadays <laughs> yeah well uh, it's 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 very important as you say to to uh, also if you don't don't have a, a deal with a with a publisher or a distributor who will help you out with with the marketing stuff uh, to actually work on you know your presence on social media and you know making people aware of the game but uh yeah making a really good game is still the very best uh you know short shot way to actually gain um a fan base and a community because people will find your game eventually i think if if the game is good enough yeah and that stuff is so important to remember that um yeah yeah, there's a lot of volume and uh, you need the exposure for your game, but still the number one priority should always be that you make the best possible game you actually can. Absolutely. So it's easy to uh, forget that when you're just uh, focusing on, on the business side of, of, of game industry. Mm. Yeah. But uh, so uh, <clears throat> uh, how do you see that uh, the game industry will change or swift uh, within now uh, coming let's say five years so is there something radical basically happening in your opinion in the industry well uh i'm, I'm not sure i'm the right person to ask uh I, I very much live in the now and just look at what what's available uh you know um and that goes into every aspect of my my life really i just uh i don't have like a you know, long-term plan for, for anything really. And just find myself in, in the situation I'm in and, and uh, trying to make the best of it. Uh, so I haven't really thought about that. I, I personally, I'm not a huge fan of, of VR. I don't think that, uh, I have a hard time f- believing that this, that will become sort of, you know, any replacement to yeah. to mouse and keyboard and regular um uh you know computer monitors or or tv screens it just you know you you shut yourself off from the outside world to to a to a high degree when you put on that helmet you know uh and and the the ear headphones and you have to clear like a space in your living room or somewhere in your house and it's it's just a it requires too much yeah. in terms of attention uh from from the user and you know space in the home and it costs a lot of money and then you lose a lot of the uh, the 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 preciseness of uh, mouse and keyboard and uh you know a lot of people who are good at something you know if you enjoy games uh, it might be because you're good at it there's there's a big chance that that's why you know you like it um and then if you switch in what way you play the games, you will sort of lose your edge or lose, you know, yeah. uh, your, uh, you'll, you'll feel bad at the games again, and then it'll, it won't be as fun. 
So uh, I don't. Yeah, see it's really interesting it, to it's... see like the uh, future generations, if I may say that, uh, who are uh, not like that much of a keyboard and mouse uh, generations. Do they find uh, VR in more interesting than than like us? <laughs> but uh, I think yeah, that uh, in, in its current current format, it's pretty uh, not obvious that uh, uh, it will go mainstream. But it sure yeah. will have its audience. That's yeah, it's it's uh, yeah, that's true. As, as you say, like there will be a new generation of of users who don't see it as you know, uh, mouse and keyboard is the way to go, and then the VR is the new thing. But rather, they grow up in a world where VR is just a an option, and then yeah. they they might as I mean, and they see the VR maybe as equal. Uh, equally interesting uh, as an, an input tool or uh, an interface uh, for playing games or, or using uh, uh, s- software, uh, really. Uh, and then that the, the, their attitude is different towards the technology, of course, than, than my attitude is because I'm an old guy. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So yeah. maybe that that will change because of that. But uh, I know I, I'm just I can't I can only you know speak for myself really and I'm, I'm i don't really believe in that so if to go back to your question uh, in five years i don't know i don't know exactly what's going to happen you know it's still just i just see it uh, maybe i'm cynical in that regard but i you know games have always been about taking something familiar you know the old and then putting 20 percent new new stuff in it you know and and uh, so that people are familiar and uh, want to try it out because they they can categorize it and they can see oh this is something that i would like and then it contains enough new spectacular stuff uh so i mean there will be more strategy games there will be more uh first person shooter games there will be more horror games there will be more mm-hmm. puzzle games you're on your cell phone everything you know i don't see see i'm not the type of person who just looks for the quantum leaps in technology yeah. and like oh everyone will have these i don't know some, yeah. some kind of a Google Glasses thing that will, you know, <laughs> augment, augmented yeah. reality and that will re- re- revolutionize, you know, I don't know. Yeah. It's just, to me, it's, it's games is all about like challenging your, you know, response time, reaction time, you know, your, your um, button combination, you know, how quick you are, you know, fighting games, reaction time and, and button combinations and, and the, your strategy games. St- um, of course, challenge your your strategic, you know, skills and and it's just those are things that will never change. Yeah. Um, the way you interact with the games might change, but I don't focus too much on that part. Uh, it's just a matter of doing creating a game that presents a, a fair challenge to the players, and uh, and makes sure that uh, the game on understand the game mer understands the rules, uh, accepts them, and then. You create a, an experience where the player is told when he or she is doing the right thing, and and uh, gets told when he or she is doing the wrong thing, and then yeah. you, yeah, it's it's all about, yeah, that stuff really, you know. Yeah, uh, indeed, it's a rather interesting question. The uh, what will happen within five years? Because of course, none of us know what will happen within five years. But uh, the funny thing, yeah. which I think is that uh, uh, basically what we answer into that question most likely affects what will actually happen within five years. <laughs> so it's yeah. just what we believe what will happen and uh, stuff like that. But uh, none of us know what will will happen in no, the end. Exactly. I mean, there might be some you know 18 20 year olds sitting in some garage somewhere and they're developing some technology right now that we don't know about yet and then yes. that will hit the market and and everything changes you yeah, can never pre- predict that stuff but uh so uh within your 18 years of uh game industry experience uh can you pick like one thing which have been the most amazing or remem- remem- rememberable experience within your whole career like one thing which pop ups into your mind. Uh, well, I I had an amazing time uh, during the like what was it ten, nine ten months that I uh, I was um, developing Bino Commander Rearmed. Uh, I was the uh, creative director on that small project and. Uh, uh, 
had the responsibility of just taking a game that I already knew and loved and and bringing it into you know into 2008 as it was because that was when we were releasing that game so it's already 10 years old now but um yeah just um be, being given that responsibility and and uh and uh, then reading re the reviews uh about the the game and uh, and, the, and and its music uh and finding that my contributions to it really really helped out that was nice uh but it was really nice also to because I was a really a little bit afraid when people uh, seemed to like the music in by no Commander Armed that I I was a little bit afraid that it would turn out that I was a one trick pony that I can only do that style of music or that you know that music was only popular because uh, fans and reviewers really liked the music in by no Commander Armed and I was a really bit a little bit afraid that that was because. Um, uh, the music was really remixed music from from the original game. I hadn't written the me melodies. I hadn't written the songs, really. I just, you know, I interpreted the original songs. Uh, uh, and uh, then with Payday and the sequel, Payday 2, Payday the Heist and the sequel, Payday 2, um, I made completely original music for those games and, and sort of created my own sound for, for, for those soundtracks or for, those, for, for that franchise, really. Yeah. And that became really popular as well. And uh, that was a relief because I was a little bit afraid that I had peaked when I made the music for Banner Commander Rearmed. But I think uh, maybe, you know, the Payday soundtrack uh, or the Payday soundtracks have really uh, transcended that, uh, the popular popularity of the Banner Commander Rearmed soundtrack. Uh, so that was that was nice, a, a nice, uh, you know, confirmation that I have something. Uh, so that was a, that's a highlight as well. And then you know, I I I don't know. I directed uh, Mike Patton, you know, the the singer from Faith No More. He was the voice actor for the main character in Bionic, Bionic Commando that was released in two thousand nine. So that was cool because I really like his music. Uh, so yeah. meeting him meeting him in real life was was awesome. So I've yeah, had a few sure. things like that. Uh, that was that, that's uh, cool. Yeah, I've had a really nice career, and uh, and uh... yeah, it sure, sure sure sounds like so. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> so uh, talking about career, uh, uh, a lot of our community members are basically beginners in the game industry or yeah. just starting off and so forth. So, what would be your tips for a person who are just starting off uh, in the game industry and making games in the first place? Uh, well, it's it's really important to have at least one out of three things: either talent, the will to work really hard, or contacts. Of course, the best thing is to have all three, but you should have at least two. If you don't have contacts, you you know people who, connections really is what I'm saying. Uh, if you don't have connections, uh, you need to be you know talented and work hard uh, to make up for that. If you don't have talent, maybe you can get somewhere still if you work hard and have connections. So uh, it's a matter of, of um, you know, uh, f uh, and even if you don't think you have talent, um, I believe that you can find a niche, like uh, something, your own voice, sort of. If it's within music, it's your own, you know, way of, you know, using instruments, recording it, or producing music, or your own, you know, melodies. You, you, might, you might just not have found it yet. So I would encourage people, you know, uh, everyone to just keep owning your skin, uh, your skills and, um, and get better, uh, you know, exercise or rather, you know, uh, yeah, polish your, your, uh, abilities really. Um, and then get in contact with people who uh, are just at the bottom rung, maybe, <laughs> I don't know, if that's a negative way of, of saying it, but, you know, people who are, you know, doing free stuff, you know, like maybe, maybe newgrounds.com or some site like that where people are developing, you know, smaller games and they're getting in contact with, you know, programmers are looking for, you know, visual uh, artists and, and uh, some, some small team are looking for a sound designer or things like that. It's a community where people can meet other 
developers and then they make these small games. Uh, uh, so your first game might not be, you know, God of War. It probably won't be God of War because uh, you're just starting out, but you just need to get, you know, experience in the game industry and working in with a, with a team. Uh, you don't even have to be on site because it's 2018 and you can work through you know, web cameras and, and you can upload things online and, and, and work, you know, remotely and that works fine, but just get the experience of, of, you know, working with other, you know, members of a team who also have, you know, creative visions and, you know, getting along with them and meeting deadlines and, and everything like that. Uh, and even if that product that you're working on a mod for an existing game, or if it's a small free to play thing or some web browser game, uh, even if that game itself isn't what gets you a job in the industry, I mean, you can put it on your CV and you can start looking for jobs. You should ha maybe have a reel or something if you're making animations or, you know, graphics or music and, and, and sound. You can have a reel and you can look for, for a job and you can point to that game that you made, even if it's not like a huge hit or even if it's not a game that's sold, you know, that, uh, that, that, that became a hit. You can still point at it and say that it was something that you've worked on. Uh, and that might not be what gets you the job because someone else in the team that worked on that game might get a job in the industry. And now they're your person on the inside. They, they are your foot in the door, sort of. Yeah. So when they're working on something, when they are working, if you made a good impression on everyone in the team, that everyone in that team is a, an ambassador for you. They will say when they're working in a company uh, and if you're a sound designer and that company is looking for a sound designer, that person will say, hey, I knew a guy, we worked on t together on this game. I can, I can maybe set up a con you know, conference call or uh, I can ask him to, to, to send in his, his reel or something like that or her reel. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm kind of uh, encourages you to uh, uh... Uh, put on uh, put on your hundred uh, percent effort in even uh, those in those small games which you work with some uh, programmer or so forth during your spare time because you never know that uh, that programmer uh, who you work with might be working in a company and actually uh, asking you to work there if you uh, did your did your job well in that absolutely, kind of a hobby absolutely. project that, yeah yeah that's exactly that's really right good point you, and good to remember put a hundred percent just not into your work but also how you treat your team teammates. Yeah. Absolutely, uh, or the other members of the team, because they will remember you if if you're uh, easy to work with and you hit the deadlines and 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 just you know if you do good job, then they will be your ambassadors. They will champion you, you know, when they meet others who are looking for people like you. Yeah, that's a really good thing to remember. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so uh, one last uh, kind of uh, let's say uh, tricky question. I'm gonna make it a little easier for you, but this is always the final question I ask from everyone. <laughs> that right. uh, so um, so let's uh, imagine a situation in which you would have infinite resources, and I'm talking about everything like money and uh, employees and what whatsoever, like everything, uh, infinite resources. Uh, what would be the one thing which you would uh, most likely do? <laughs> well, um, wow. Um, <laughs> Sorry, man. I, I would say, I would say that it w wouldn't be so much about what game I would, because uh, I'm, we're talking about game development, right? Uh, actually, the, the tricky part is that uh, we, we don't. You're just saying that you will get oh, so infinite, can... infinite resources. Yeah. Okay, so that would mean that I, if I would much rather work in 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 uh, uh, space travel than I yeah <laughs> yeah move into move yeah. into that. Okay. Uh yeah, that makes it even harder. I mean, if the question was hard enough. It was just if it was just <laughs> about uh, game development. But what I was gonna say is that um, it's not. Maybe this sounds cheesy, but it's not so much uh, what you're doing, you know, but if you're doing it with people that you like under circumstances that, that you can, you know, where you can sustain yourself. Uh, so if you like your, your, your uh, colleagues uh, and enjoy what you're doing, you know, it's, it's stimulating creatively, then... Uh, you don't have to make 
you know, $100,000 a month. That's not the dream, really, uh, because you can't, you can't buy, the, the happiness will really come from, uh, money will think, make things easier, of course, but uh, the happiness really comes from, from just, uh, you know, the stimulation of, of your work and, and being able to, to uh, interact with other people that you like. Um, so I would use the money probably to do, to, to continue <laughs> making games, I guess, uh, and make sure that I continue working with, with the people that, that I really, uh, get along with, uh, and we could make whatever we wanted to because we had all the resources. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, unless this is supposed to be some sort of, uh, you know, create world peace sort of question. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it's I mean, just within, a tricky question to, yeah. resources we could we could eradicate uh you know uh famine and uh and uh, yeah. fix yeah, fix uh, <laughs> you know the the uh uh what's the word the the climate uh yeah, problems climate, and everything yeah, yeah. uh so yeah th that goes without saying really but what, yeah. i just want to put the thought in people's minds that maybe it's not you know if you're thinking of a career uh, you've come really far if you like what you're doing and you're doing it with people that you like. Yeah, that's actually a really, really good stuff to remember because uh, a lot of uh, I hear a lot of people are chasing the uh, like the money dream that you would uh, make a hit game and make make uh, tons of money out of it, and that's like the core motivation into making games. And yeah. for me, it sounds sad because uh, that's not the reason I personally came to the game industry. It, that's the, what you mentioned that I uh, have fun with good people and make awesome games. So, but uh, and the money uh, should be a side product uh, product within that. But uh, of course, I I understand because it's a rising industry. We have a lot of people in, in the game industry coming here to uh, chase the dream which they've seen in the media and so forth. So yeah. But yeah. So, but hey, uh, one last time, uh, GTF. O is on Steam and it will be available on spring 2019 and uh, so make sure to put that on your wish list if you like the game go watch the trailer and I, th and I th think that uh, after watching the trailer you will most likely put it on your wish list so go <laughs> check it out yeah we sure hope so uh, yeah so but hey Simon thank you very much for your time and uh for joining the interview and uh, hopefully you enjoyed your time as well because I did a lot thanks for ha having me and uh, yeah it was a really nice talk right hey, cheers man and thanks bye thanks bye.